So, Dune came out. Part 1, anyway. And the second part has been greenlit, so part 2 is coming eventually. This video is going to be two things. First, my thoughts on the film. And second, a little dive into the ridiculous woke takes that quote-unquote journalists have been writing about it. Nobody's allowed to enjoy things anymore. That fruit you snack on? It's racist. The clothes you're wearing? It's all about imperialism. The screen you're watching this on? It voted for Trump. Alright, let's get into it. First off, if you don't know what Dune is, watch this video, top right. With that in mind, I'm not going to explain the basic premise or even go over the David Lynch film. I'm just going to review this movie, though I likely will compare it to the Lynch version here and there. Also worth mentioning, I'm not holding back on spoilers. So in the style of YMS, here's your warning, 3, 2, 1. Villeneuve's Dune is good. It's great, really. 9 out of 10. Based purely on visuals, it's kind of a masterpiece. That whole every frame of painting thing? Yeah, it definitely applies to this film. Like with his previous films Arrival and Blade Runner 2049, Denis Villeneuve has an amazing vision for large-scale spectacle set pieces, and he utilizes it beautifully in Dune. Enormous, boxy spaceships floating without any sort of visible propulsion over sweeping vistas of both Caladan and Arrakis. The rain-drenched, stone-cold world of the Sardaukar, all of it just looks spectacular. It has some of that weird quality that Lynch's Dune had, though very much toned down. Costuming and set design really feels like a love letter to Lynch, and I appreciate that. Elements of it also resemble Hodorowsky's Dune, such as the dragonfly design of the Ornithopters, which look absolutely amazing. Now, visuals aren't the only element required for a good film, so let's go over some other things. First, casting. I enjoy pretty much everyone, and the exceptions I have are not necessarily the fault of the actors themselves. For instance, while I enjoyed Timothy Chalamet as Paul and Oscar Isaac as Leto, Rebecca Ferguson as Lady Jessica had moments I didn't care for. I can't tell if it's Ferguson's performance or the way the story is written, but she felt somewhat one note throughout the film, constantly terrified of everything going on around her and never displaying the confidence of Lady Jessica in the books, or Francesca Annis in the Lynch film. Similarly, Stellan Skarsgård as the Baron Harkonnen seems like a solid choice, as Skarsgård has proven himself to be a very versatile and charismatic actor, but the Baron he portrays is too quiet, mopey, and a little soulless. Now, Lynch's Baron was too over the top, which, while part of that film's charm, simply wouldn't work in this new universe. I simply felt he could have been a little more intimidating and suave as he was in the novels. Of course, novels and their film adaptations are separate beasts and should be treated as such, but it's worth pointing out at least to me. What else is good about the movie? Uh, it's got Jason Momoa in it. Everybody likes him, right? No, but really, he does add some much-needed lightheartedness to a film that threatens to drown itself in taking everything super seriously. Then again, that's kind of what Dune is. It's a bit of a dense and bleak anti-hero tale where a lot of people die and a lot of horrible things happen. It's not exactly baby's first science fiction. There's only one other thing I didn't like about this film, and it's something I can forgive it for. It skipped both the Guild Navigator and the Folding of Space to travel to Arrakis. Again, Lynch's Navigator is ridiculous, deviating heavily from the source material, which describes them as roughly amphibian humanoids, but it's to serve his purpose of his wonky world. However, Villeneuve decided to omit the Navigator, at least for now, as well as any scene in which the Navigator uses the Holtzman Drive to fold space and travel to Arrakis. Instead, we see spaceships boarding the Space and Guild Highliner, which looks very cool, by the way, and then we see them exit again in space above Arrakis. It's not a necessary scene, but damn it, I wanted it. Oh well. Like I said, any flaws I found aside, it's an amazing film and a promising start in a good adaptation that fans have been waiting for for decades. I will say this before we move forward. While I do love the new film, part of me began to reappreciate how ambitious and wonderfully weird Lynch's movie is. There's so many things about it that make you say, what? Remember when Patrick Stewart carried a pug into an epic battle? Remember how the Harkonnens poisoned a guy and then forced him to milk a cat in a cage to get the antidote? Remember how there's just a little person in a hallway poking an upside-down cow? Yeah. Lynch's Dune is fun, if somewhat incomplete and janky in his presentation. So, journalists suck, am I right? Like, when was the last time you saw a journalist go viral for writing a good review of any product? 
It's always something ridiculous these days. Pump the shock and awe factor up to 11, get everyone to read whatever stupid shit people are vomiting up next. I guess I'm kind of feeding into it by reacting to the clipbait, but goddammit, it annoys me. Let's take a look at the first article coming from... The Escapist? Seriously? The platform that Yahtzee Crosshaw is from? Damn, you guys fell off. I used to love zero punctuation. So, right from the title, you can see why it's stupid, right? Dune's Paul Atreides is the ultimate mighty whitey. Hey, wanna play a drinking game? Yeah, you'll die, so don't drink every time you see mighty whitey or a variation thereof. So, for those who are unaware, the mighty whitey trope began in the 18th and 19th century, when Europeans were visiting many parts of the world for the very first time. A mighty whitey would be an honorable, strong, charismatic, educated, and usually noble white man who ends up living with some kind of native tribe and not only learns their ways, but also becomes a kind of leader. It's generally viewed as a positive spin on colonialism, and while a little outdated, actually has its roots in reality. Specifically in the case of Dune, Paul's time on Arrakis is meant to parallel Lawrence of Arabia, a British soldier who defended the Arab army against the Turks during the First World War. So, let me break it down for you guys. Is Paul Atreides a mighty whitey? Yes. Is this a bad thing? No. Because the entire point of the story, at least the novel, is that Paul is not the savior he is originally envisioned to be. In fact, in later novels, Paul's reign as Galactic Emperor results in a bloody jihad across the stars, and entire planets are wiped out of existence in his name. The entire purpose of Paul's character is to be a careful-what-you-wish-for tale when it comes to savior figures. So, basically, all of these articles are going to fail on this note for two reasons. They either don't get the fact that Paul is a bad Mighty Whitey, or they're just idiots for coming to this conclusion after seeing literally 50% of the story. Remember that, because every single journalist you're going to see today forgot that this is part one of two. In its opening, this article presents a list of traits that make Paul the most, quote, egregiously, preposterously overpowered uber-hero in the history of explored space. Well, again, this is not the point, let's go through this list and see how many of these traits are shared by other characters in the Dune universe. 1. An unbeatable hand-to-hand -hand fighter. First off, hand-to-hand -hand is written like this, with dashes, but second, so is every single Bene Gesserit and eventually Fremen under his reign. Where do you think he learned it from? 2. A human calculating supercomputer. So are the Bene Gesserit and the Mentats. How much will it cost them, traveling all this way for this formality? Three guild navigators, a total of 1.46 million 62 salaries round trip. 3. A genetically engineered male witch with a voice that must be obeyed. Again, a trait shared by every Bene Gesserit. You dismissed my mother in her own house. Come here, kneel. And it's worth noting that Paul's skill with the voice is limited at first. There's even a scene about that in the movie. Remove her gag. <coughs> Shut up. 4. A seer with the ability to predict the future, a trait he shares with guild navigators and his sister Aaliyah, and probably some others, I haven't read all the books in the series. 5. A matchless military strategist. Up for debate. He's good, but his victories are largely a result of the fanatical following of Fremen he has. 6. The chosen one of multiple interlocking prophecies. Actually, wrong. Paul is not the Kwisatz Haderach from the prophecies. The prophecies are Bene Gesserit creations that were made with the intention of being fulfilled by a child that was the result of a Harkonnen man and an Atreides woman. However, Lady Jessica defied orders and had Paul, out of her deep love for the Duke and his desire for a son. Let's just quickly skip over the fact that Jessica and likely all Bene Gesserit can deliberately decide the sex of their unborn children. 7. All of the above, which I've pointed out, most of which are shared by the Bene Gesserit and others. The list later says that, quote, Everyone in Dune is always staring at Paul open-mouthed and thinking about how awesome he is. Even Jessica, Paul's mother, is overwhelmed, musing about how she's trained his intelligence, but now found herself fearful of it. Paul is amazing. Paul is terrifying. Be amazed and terrified, reader. First off, that's not the correct use of a semicolon. Second, being afraid of someone is not awesome, you moron. You know who people are afraid of? The guy with a knife in a dark alley. Serial killers. Mass shooters. Mass murdering dictators. You know why you're afraid of those people? 
because in that moment, they have some form of power over you when you're at their whim, and they might wield it in a terrible way. Paul is basically all of those, and none of them are awesome. The article ends by summarizing Dune as a quote, bloated mighty whitey trope, which, while accurate, completely misses the point. I hate to be that guy, but like all those people who said if you didn't like Inception, you just didn't get it, quite frankly, you didn't get it. Let's move on to the next article. So Laura Helmuth, verified checkmark, imagine my surprise, says, quote, Movies like Dune perpetuate the idea that deserts and drylands are wastelands, and already I'm banging my head on the desk. I'm not even going to go into the fact that the detailed ecology of Dune is a primary theme in the story, but I am going to show you the very first page of Herbert's novel. To the people whose labors go beyond ideas into the realm of, quote, real materials, to the dryland ecologists, wherever they may be, in whatever time they work, this effort at prediction is dedicated in humility and admiration. So, uh, maybe you should just be quiet, Laura Helmuth. The next one is titled, What Even Is Dune? by Clara Lampin for the Cut, to which I respond, Who even are you, Clara Lampin for the Cut? Oh. Okay. Off to a great start. So Clara says the cliff notes on the plot is, quote, Spaceship go whirr, cannon go boom, orchestra go boar. Apparently, Claire is confused about what the word plot means, because what she's describing is the setting and the tone. Next, she says, quote, Everything in this movie is either incredibly big or incredibly small. I fail to see a problem. She then complains about the bureaucracy of the universe by inventing bureaucracy that isn't in the movie or the books. Which elites have import-export rights in which provinces? I think you mean which noble house is holding stewardship over Arrakis? What are the specific bylaws governing a leadership transition? Uh, apparently none, because the hook of the plot is a deadly coup staged by the Emperor himself to literally just murder House Atreides while they sleep. If someone wants to lodge a complaint, which regulatory blah 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 you're making things up because you think you're funny? Every few minutes, Claire says, the movie's plot stops for a series of perfume commercials featuring Zendaya wandering around the desert. Well, you see, Claire. In the business, we call this foreshadowing. So, at the end of her article, Claire asks the question, is Dune a colonialist story? Why, yes, Claire, yes it is. She actually came really close to getting it by pointing out that the stewards of Arrakis want only the planet's natural resources and don't really care for the Fremen. But then she fumbles it by saying that, quote, Paul appears to be a benevolent ruler, which is to say something of a white savior. And it has come to my attention that Herbert pilfered a bunch of Arabic and Persian words, embedding them in the architecture of his sprawling dune world, a practice known today as appropriation. <sighs> no, Claire. It's called inspiration. I am tired of this stupid trend. 99 times out of 100, unless you're doing f***ing blackface, things that are called cultural appropriation are more often inspired homages to those cultures made from a deep place of appreciation, and the cultures portrayed rarely see it as a negative thing. Here's an example. This guy asked several college students if his outfit was offensive, and most said it was, and it's cultural appropriation. He then went into a Mexican community in his town and asked if the Mexican people there were offended by it. Let's see how they felt. Do you like my costume? I like your, your, your mustache. Do you? Mostly. <laughs> Does my outfit offend you? You look, no, 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 you look nice. Thank you. Do you like my costume? Yes. Does it? Offend you? Uh, is offensivo? No. Do you like my outfit? Oh yeah, it's awesome. Does my outfit offend you? No, not at all. Some people get offended by what I'm wearing. No, it's not. It's not offensive. I think it's... Uh, you're in the right atmosphere. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, stop confusing appropriation with appreciation. Alright, last article. Title is, Grey is for Drama. Sounds like someone is sad the movie didn't have enough bright colors to keep their attention. Like a toddler. But speaking of Paul as a chosen one, who boy does Dune walk right into some ugly Orientalism and white savior complexes? What? What in the fuck is Orientalism? In art history, literature, and cultural studies, Orientalism is the imitation or depiction of aspects in the Eastern world. Okay, so yeah, Dune has plenty of Orientalism, but ugly? Please justify that, I'm waiting. Paul might be special not only to Jessica's magical ladies, but also to the indigenous desert dwellers of Arrakis, the Fremen. Yes, yes he is, but let's back up for a second. Jessica's magical ladies? 
Is it just me, or does that sound like someone deliberately trying to play down the feminist themes of the story? You know, the part where women lead an organization of psychics who literally pull the strings of all galactic politics. Anyway, yes, Paul is special to the Fremen. Why? Because of the Bene Gesserit. They planted an idea in the heads of the Fremen, and now the Fremen are seeing that idea fulfilled in the form of Paul, something the Bene Gesserit did not want. Moving on. Quote, the actors playing the Fremen are all BIPOC and Javier Bardem, who thinks Hollywood is BIPOC. Oh my god, shut up. Yes, of course, the Fremen are dark-skinned. They live in a fucking desert. Who cares? I'm done. All of these articles are just complaining about either missing the point of the story or saying that making a desert culture inspired by the Middle East is racist or something. It's also ridiculous and clearly clickbait. Journalism is dead, and I'm done with it. If you enjoy this content, consider hitting the subscribe button. If you really enjoy this content, consider donating on Patreon, becoming a member, buying some of my books on Amazon, or buying some of my merch. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you over the curve, Space Cowboys.